The antique shop had always been a place of mystery and intrigue. But what happened that night surpassed all my expectations. We had just stepped out of the portal, and once again I was faced with shelves cluttered with ancient relics, books with cracked covers, and dim light filtering through dusty windows. Meister Mortimer, old and unflappable, stood beside me when suddenly a werewolf leaped out of the portal behind us. He was a nightmare creature. His bared fangs gleamed in the dim light, and his eyes burned with wild fury. His fur, thick and black as a moonless night, seemed to move on its own. I froze, unable to move or make a sound. Inside, everything was paralyzed, and terror gripped every cell of my body. The shopkeeper, however, did not lose his composure. His movements were quick and precise, like a master performing a well-practiced trick. He waved his hand, and the werewolf, snarling and growling, was suspended in midair as if paralyzed by an invisible force. It seemed as if time had stopped with him. The old man held him aloft with one hand while quickly opening one of the many cabinets with the other. From inside, he pulled out an amulet on a chain which gleamed with a dull but mesmerizing light. Then he placed the amulet on the werewolf and something unimaginable happened. The creature began to transform before our eyes. His fur slowly disappeared, his fangs shortened, and his fiery eyes took on a human appearance. He collapsed to the ground and before us stood a middle-aged man. His face, now calm and haggard, bore the marks of many years of suffering. Thick dark hair framed his strong features and deep wrinkles indicated a hard life full of pain and hardship. He lay on the floor breathing heavily, gradually recovering from the transformation. Then, sitting on the floor, he looked around in bewilderment, glancing from me to the shopkeeper. I approached the man and helped him up. He swayed as if his body still did not obey him, but he grasped my hand firmly. His eyes, now human, sparkled with gratitude and exhaustion. Thank you, he muttered, his voice hoarse from long silence. Where am I? Mr. Mortimer only smiled his mysterious smile and pointed me to the kitchen. Bring us some tea, he said. Then he gently took the man by the elbow and led him to an old oak table offering him a seat. I quickly went to the kitchen. The water boiled on the stove and I brewed tea, adding a few pinches of calming herbs that Mr. Mortimer always kept on hand, pouring tea into cups. I suddenly realized how much my fingers were trembling. Sighing, I pulled myself together and returned to the room, not forgetting to bring a plate of crackers. The man sat at the table, his gaze wandering around the shop, lingering on each antique item. I poured the tea into cups and placed the plate of crackers on the table. The man awkwardly took a cup, his hands still trembling slightly. He sipped the hot drink as if he hadn't had tea in many years, then took another sip, closing his eyes in pleasure. We remained silent while he drank, giving him time to recover. When the cup was empty, I quietly refilled it for him. Mr. Mortimer leaned back in his chair and began to tell the story of our shop. The man listened intently, his eyes wide open like a child hearing a fairy tale for the first time. After finishing his story, Mr. Mortimer fell silent. The man stood up from his chair and, dropping to his knees, began to thank us, his voice trembling with emotion. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. His words were interrupted by sobs. I felt awkward and once again helped him up. When he sat down again, I thrust a cup of tea and a cracker into his hands. The man took them gratefully, but his hands were still shaking. Mr. Mortimer, leaning on the table, looked at him with his piercing gaze. Now, my friend, tell us what happened to you, he said, his voice quiet but firm. 
The man leaned back in his chair, his face shadowed by memories like a foggy ghost of the past. His eyes roamed the room as if searching the shadows for images long drowned in his memory. It all began many years ago. He started quietly, his voice like the rustle of old pages. I had a daughter. Her name was Emma. She was my light in the darkness, my only joy in life. We lived in a small house on the edge of the forest. He paused as if gathering his thoughts, then continued. One night, when the moon was particularly bright, I heard a strange noise at the door. Opening it, I saw an old man in rags. His eyes glowed with madness and his voice was hoarse. He said I was chosen for a great purpose, that my destiny was tied to the moonlight. I thought he was crazy and drove him away. He paused, his eyes clouded with memories. I didn't give it much thought. That night I went to bed but woke up feeling strange. My body was burning. Every cell was consumed with unbearable pain. I ran out of the house and fell to my knees under the moonlight. That night I transformed for the first time. I became a beast, a monster, unable to control my actions. He fell silent, trembling at the memories. His eyes were full of suffering and guilt. I don't remember what happened next. Just fragments, pieces of a mosaic, blood, screams. When I came to, the house was destroyed. Emma was nowhere to be found. I searched for her everywhere, but found no trace. Every time I transformed, I lost more of my humanity until I became just a beast. Time lost its meaning. Everything merged into one endless torment. What happened next, I don't remember. The man slumped, his shoulders sagging, and his voice barely audible. I want to return to my daughter, but I'm afraid to find out if she's even alive. I felt sorry for him. I also had a younger sister, and I understood his pain. A desire to help flared up inside me. I looked at Mr. Mortimer with hope. The old man pondered for a moment, his eyes sparkling with hidden knowledge. The amulet on you won't work for long. We must act quickly. There is no cure for your condition, but there is a way to help you control yourself, even in wolf form. The man fell to his knees again, his voice trembling with pleading. Please, help me. I ran to him and helped him up. Mr. Mortimer smiled his eyes glowing with kindness and determination. Of course, we will help, he said confidently. He pointed to the shop's motto, which hung high on the wall, written in golden letters, Ask and you shall receive. Strangely, I had never noticed it before, I thought, scratching my head. Meister Mortimer looked thoughtfully at the man, then turned to me and began to explain, the method we need is kept in an ancient book. This book belonged to a great explorer who dedicated his life to studying magic and lunar curses. It is now stored in an ancient library hidden deep underground in China. He paused to let us grasp the importance of his words, then continued. This library belongs to ancient beings known as grammar ghouls. For centuries, they have collected all rare manuscripts and kept them. Your task is to sneak in and obtain the necessary book because these beings will never willingly part with their possessions. Also, they are not very fond of humans. This mission is quite dangerous, so think carefully, Michael, if you are ready for it. I nodded in agreement. In all the time I've worked here, I've gotten used to danger. This mission would help a person, so there was no need to think long. Seeing my determination, Mr. Mortimer nodded approvingly, then took a magical pouch from me and began to put things into it that might come in handy. Amulets, potions, several ancient scrolls. Finishing, he handed it to me. Standing with the pouch in one hand, I held a skull in the other. Mr. Mortimer looked at me with surprise. Why are you holding that? he asked. 
I was equally puzzled, but before I could answer, the skull spoke. I like being carried. Mr. Mortimer frowned and began to scold it. Yorick, how many times have I told you not to bother people? It replied in a sulky tone. But I really do like being carried. Suddenly the skull shrank to the size of a pea and, with a little jump, flew to my ear. It attached itself to my earlobe with a small bone protrusion that had grown from its top. I didn't feel any pain, but there was a strange sensation of weight on my ear. Raising my hand, I felt the tiny skull hanging like an earring. Although it was small, its voice was still clear to me. Now we'll always be in touch, whispered Yorick with a grin. I took the pouch, feeling a mix of excitement and apprehension about the upcoming mission. Meanwhile, Mr. Mortimer opened a portal from which emanated ancient magic and a misty light. Ready? he asked, looking at me and Thomas. I nodded, feeling my pulse quicken. The werewolf's face showed determination. We stepped into the portal and the world around us disappeared. The moment we crossed the portal's threshold, I felt my entire body being pulled into a vortex, as if thousands of invisible hands were dragging us through space and time. Sounds and colors blended into a booming chaos, pierced by flashes of light. Yorick, hanging from my ear, giggled quietly, enjoying our journey. Time lost its meaning and space ceased to exist. And then, in an instant, we found ourselves on solid ground. We were in a cramped closet surrounded by dusty old items. I cautiously opened the door and saw that we were in a small souvenir shop. The owners weren't there yet. We quietly stepped out of the closet, trying not to make any noise. Passing by shelves laden with trinkets and knick-knacks, I opened the front door, mentally apologizing to the owners, and we stepped outside. I looked around and realized we were in some tourist spot. The streets were narrow and cobblestone, flanked by ancient buildings with tiled roofs and carved wooden decorations. The air was filled with the scent of fresh morning air mixed with the aromas of herbs and spices wafting from the still-closed shops. I asked Yorick what we needed to do next. We need to wait until evening, he replied. Since it's morning now, we have the whole day ahead of us. We decided to take a walk. Gradually, people began to appear on the streets. Tourists with cameras, locals opening their shops, and children playing near the houses. There was an atmosphere of calm and slight excitement, characteristic of the start of a new day. As we walked through the streets, we came across a shop where an old man was sitting out front. He was bent over with a long white beard and piercing eyes. On his stall lay ancient items, ceramic vessels, old coins, figurines, and amulets. We stopped to take a closer look at these items. Suddenly, I heard Yorick's excited voice. One of these items is very valuable. You must acquire it. I grew wary and began to carefully inspect the merchandise. Yorick guided me, whispering softly in my ear. That figurine on the left. It's from an ancient collection, and its magical properties could help us. I looked closely at the indicated item. It was a small bronze figurine depicting a mythical creature with wings and horns. I felt that it indeed contained some sort of power. The old man looked at me carefully and asked something in Chinese. I didn't know the language and felt a wave of confusion. At that moment, Yorick started whispering something in my ear, and gradually I began to understand what the old man was saying. What do you want? His voice echoed and I suddenly understood every word. To my surprise, I responded in perfect Chinese. I would like to know about this figurine. The old man looked at me in surprise, not expecting me to speak the language so well. Then he glanced at the item I requested and shook his head firmly. I cannot sell this figurine, he said firmly. 
I was at a loss, not knowing what to do next. At that moment, Yorick whispered to me again, Repeat after me. Then he said a phrase in a language I didn't understand. I repeated it, not knowing the meaning of the words. The old man's face changed. His eyes widened in astonishment. He trembled and bowed deeply, then hurried to wrap the figurine for me. But I have no money, I said, suddenly remembering. The old man, continuing to wrap the figurine, responded with reverence. I wouldn't take money from you anyway. It is an honor that you visited my shop. You are welcome here any time. I took the figurine and placed it in the magical pouch, which didn't deform at all. The old man, noticing this, became even more servile, his eyes shining with respect. Thank you, I said, bowing in return. We left the shop and I asked Yorick, what did that phrase mean? He quietly replied, It's a code word belonging to the Guild of Antiquities Keepers. There are people who know about them and hold them in high esteem. We were lucky that the old man was aware. We spent the rest of the day strolling through the narrow streets of this ancient town. Tourists and locals gradually filled the streets, adding noise and liveliness to the place. We walked past shops with bright lanterns, the aromas of street food and souvenirs available at every corner. At some point, I reached into the magical pouch and found money there. I happily bought a few souvenirs for my younger sister. A beautiful silk scarf, a miniature porcelain figurine, and a wooden toy. Then we had lunch in a small restaurant where they served local delicacies. The food was delicious and filling, and I savored every bite, knowing that a long day lay ahead. When evening came and the street started to empty, we headed to one of the deserted alleys. There, silence reigned, and only the dim light of lanterns illuminated our path. Yorick instructed me to take out the ancient book we had brought with us. I carefully pulled it out of the pouch and placed it on the ground. The book was covered in ancient symbols and emitted a faint glow, as if it were a source of light itself. We hid around the corner and waited, ensuring no one noticed our presence. Time passed slowly. Darkness thickened and the air grew cooler. I felt my heart beating faster and every sound seemed too loud in the silence. Yorick, hanging from my ear, whispered quiet, calming words, reminding me that everything was going according to plan. Suddenly, a fox emerged from the shadows, her fur glistening in the dim light. She sniffed the air cautiously, then approached the book. After a moment of hesitation, she grabbed the book in her teeth and darted away, disappearing into the alley. I watched this scene in surprise and quietly asked Yorick, What kind of creature is that? Should we chase after her? Yorick replied, his voice calm and assured, That's a Bibliolisa. They serve the grammar ghouls. We don't need to chase her. You'll see why. As soon as he said this, a thin glowing line appeared on the ground before us, stretching in the direction where the fox had disappeared. There was a special mark on that book. We just need to follow the trail, explained Yorick. We did as he said. I walked first, following the glowing line, and Thomas followed behind me. I glanced at Thomas. He was nervous, his eyes darting around anxiously, and his muscles tensed with every step. I wondered if his curse might relapse. We moved through the narrow streets, following the glowing line. The trail led us through deserted alleys and abandoned courtyards where the shadows seemed even darker and more menacing. The place we were in was old, and every step echoed in the night's silence. Finally, the glowing line led us to an old manhole. It looked abandoned, covered in moss and rust, but as we approached, I saw that it had been recently opened. With effort, we lifted the lid and peered inside. Below, a dark staircase led into the unknown. We began to descend. 
The stairs creaked under our feet and the air grew damper and staler. Finally, we found ourselves in a sewer. Water trickled faintly beneath our feet, reflecting the light of our magical trail. The walls were covered in mold and the smell was far from pleasant. Thomas walked behind me, his face focused and tense. We followed the glowing line which led us through the winding tunnels of the sewer. At every turn, I glanced back to make sure Thomas was all right. Soon we reached a massive door at the end of the tunnel. It was adorned with ancient symbols and looked as if it hadn't been opened in centuries. I pushed hard to open it and it creaked open with a dull groan. Behind the door was the entrance to a cave. We entered. The cave was enormous, with high vaults that disappeared into the darkness. The walls glowed with a soft green light reflecting the faint glow of the magical trail on the ground. We continued to walk, following this trail which now seemed even brighter. The path became increasingly winding and we began to descend deeper. The air grew cooler and every step echoed in this vast space. Suddenly, the glowing line led us to a massive stone door adorned with intricate carvings. The door was locked and we had no choice but to hide and wait. But luck was on our side. Soon a fox appeared in the cave, carrying a scroll. She approached the wall and pressed symbols with her paws, causing the door to rumble open and the fox slipped inside. We seized the opportunity and rushed in after her. We barely made it through before the stone door slammed shut behind us. We found ourselves in a narrow stone corridor adorned with intricate carvings and ancient writings. The carved symbols seemed alive, glowing with a soft green light that reflected off the stone walls, creating a mysterious atmosphere. Continuing down the corridor, we emerged into a vast cave filled with towering shelves holding books, manuscripts, and scrolls. The cave was incredibly spacious with high ceilings lost in darkness. Light emanated from glowing crystals embedded in the walls and ceiling. Between the shelves moved strange creatures, grammar ghouls. I stopped watching them in amazement. Grammar ghouls were small humanoid beings no taller than a meter. Their skin resembled old parchment, dimly glimmering in the crystal light. Their eyes glowed with a green light like two emeralds. They had long, thin fingers, perfectly suited for handling books and scrolls. They wore simple garments made of thin fabric resembling ancient scrolls. The grammar ghouls whispered quietly among themselves, discussing something. They handled the books with care, gently turning the pages and carefully placing the manuscripts back in their places. Their movements had a certain grace, typical of beings whose lives were dedicated to preserving and protecting knowledge. We hid behind one of the tall shelves, staying in the shadows to avoid being seen. Following Yorick's instructions, I rummaged in the magical pouch and soon found something unusual. I carefully pulled the item into the light. It was an ancient artifact resembling an amulet made of dark metal covered with fine patterns that glowed with a faint green light. In the center of the amulet was a small crystal, shimmering with various hues as if absorbing the light and magic of the surrounding world. The amulet hung on a thin chain of the same metal, and its size allowed it to be easily concealed in the palm. The runic symbols on its surface seemed alive, pulsating in rhythm with my heartbeat. Yorick whispered to me, This is a subjugation amulet. With it, we can influence a grammar ghoul and make it do our bidding. But it must be used carefully. We waited, hiding in the shadows. Soon, one of the grammar ghouls passed by us, unaware of our presence. His eyes glowed with a green light. I raised the amulet, pointing it at the grammar ghoul, and felt the artifact's energy begin to pulse in my hand. I concentrated and uttered the ancient words Yorick whispered to me. Heart of light, 
Command the darkness, power of the ancients, obey my will. The grammar ghoul stopped his eyes, flashed brighter for a moment, then became hazy. He turned toward us and approached, his movements now slow and obedient. What do you command, master? He whispered in an ancient language, his voice quiet and respectful. I looked at Yorick, awaiting further instructions. Yorick quietly explained what to do. Tell him to take us to the secret scroll that will help Thomas. I nodded and addressed the grammar ghoul. Take us to the scroll that holds the secrets of lunar curses. The grammar ghoul bowed and quietly led us through the labyrinth of shelves and racks. We followed him trying to move quietly and unseen. The path was winding and dark, lit only by the dim glow of the crystals embedded in the cave walls. We passed by ancient tomes and manuscripts, each holding invaluable knowledge. The walls were adorned with carvings and writings telling stories of long forgotten events and magic. Finally, the grammar ghoul stopped in front of a massive shelf reaching high into the air. He reached for one of the upper shelves and pulled out a book wrapped in thin fabric. He then carefully handed the book to me, bowing. Here is the scroll you sought, master, he whispered. I took the book and felt the magic of the key beginning to weaken. The grammar ghoul froze, his eyes glowing green again, then becoming hazy once more. I exhaled in relief and opened the book, starting to flip through the pages. Each page was filled with ancient spells and ritual descriptions. Finally, I found the necessary spell, a ritual that could help Thomas control his curse. I nodded in satisfaction and carefully placed the book in the pouch. Looking around, I decided we had a bit of time to find something else interesting. My gaze fell on a book with a wind symbol on its cover. My intuition told me this book might also be important. I reached out and carefully took it from the shelf. As soon as I opened the book, a strong wind suddenly rose. It began to sweep books and scrolls off the shelves, creating chaos in the cave. Pages of books swirled in the air and scrolls scattered in different directions. The wind was so strong that I could barely stay on my feet. At that moment, I heard a shout. The grammar ghouls had noticed us. I slammed the book shut, but the wind didn't cease. They've spotted us, I yelled over the noise of the wind. We started to run, not looking back, while the wind continued to rage, lifting books and scrolls into the air. The sounds of our steps echoed through the vast cave and the walls reflected the echo of our run. Suddenly, we heard a rumble. Looking back, I saw that we were being pursued by golems. The golems were enormous creatures made of stone and metal, their bodies covered in ancient runes and symbols glowing in the dim light. Their eyes burned with red fire, and each step was accompanied by a loud rumble. They moved slowly but surely, their massive stone hands ready to grab us at any moment. Run faster, I shouted. We kept running, trying to widen the gap between us and the golems. I felt my heart pounding wildly in my chest and my breathing became more and more ragged. Despite his anxiety, Thomas kept pace, his face twisted with determination and fear. Suddenly, Yorick yelled in my ear, take out that statuette and throw it on the ground. I didn't hesitate. I pulled the bronze statuette depicting a mythical creature with wings and horns from the pouch. Clutching it in my hand, I threw it to the ground in front of us. As soon as the statuette touched the ground, thick smoke rose, obscuring everything around us. I felt the air fill with magic. The smoke quickly dissipated, and in place of the statuette appeared the monster depicted on it. The monster was huge and formidable. Its body was covered in scales, shimmering like bronze. Its wings spread wide, blocking half the corridor. Horns, glowing with magical light, gave it a fearsome appearance. Its eyes glowed bright red, and smoke billowed from its maw. The monster roared loudly, 
turning to the golems and charged at them. The roar filled the entire cave and the walls trembled from the powerful impact as it clashed with the golems. The stone giants slowed, their attention now on the new opponent. We ran towards the exit without looking back. Our hearts were pounding wildly and our breaths were ragged from exhaustion and adrenaline. At the end of the corridor, I saw a door and we dashed towards it, knowing we were being chased. We burst through the door and with effort, flung it open and rushed through. Soon, we found ourselves in the cave we had been in earlier. I quickly pulled out a powder from the pouch that Yorick had given me earlier. It was a magical powder capable of creating a portal. Hurry up! Yorick shouted, his voice trembling with tension. I scattered the powder in the air and it began to glow, creating a vortex of light and magic around us. The powder quickly dissolved in the air and a portal opened before us. It pulsed, emitting a soft light that beckoned us inside. I looked back and saw hordes of angry grammar ghouls and golems rushing toward us. Their eyes burned with fury, and their movements were quick and determined. Run! I shouted without a second thought. I was the first to jump into the portal, feeling the magical energy envelop me, transporting us through space. Thomas followed, his face twisted with determination and fear. As we passed through the portal, I felt the world around us change. The cave, the grammar ghouls, and the golems were left behind. The vortex of light carried us to another place, safe from those who pursued us. We landed on the ground, feeling our bodies adapt to the new place. Looking around, I saw that we were in a familiar space, Mr. Mortimer's old shop. The ancient relics and books surrounding us once again filled the space with coziness and tranquility. When we tumbled out of the portal, I saw Mr. Mortimer sitting at the counter. He waved his hand and the portal closed, disappearing instantly as if it had never been there. I exhaled, feeling the tension gradually leave my body. But there was no time to relax. I noticed that Thomas was on the verge of collapse. His face contorted with pain and fear. He was barely holding himself together. Quickly, give me the book! Yorick shouted, his voice full of urgency. I quickly handed the book to Mr. Mortimer. He grabbed it and began flipping through the pages rapidly, reading aloud the ingredients for the ritual. Meadow flower petals gathered under the light of a full moon. Wolf's blood blessed by an ancient spell. Mandrake root purified in spring water and... He paused, frowning. Ah, uh, a uh, dragon's tear. Mr. Mortimer looked around, his eyes sparkling with determination. We have everything except the dragon's tear, he said, sighing. He approached Thomas, who was on the brink, his body trembling with tension and his eyes starting to glow yellow. Mr. Mortimer extended his hand and said, Calm down, Thomas. We will find a way to help you. His voice was quiet and reassuring. He placed his hand on Thomas's shoulder and magical energy began to flow from his fingers. Thomas grew still, his breathing becoming more even, and his eyes gradually lost their bright glow. Then, removing his hand from Thomas's shoulder, he looked at us with resolve. I know where we can find a dragon's tear, he said, but it will have to be stolen. This man is a villain and he won't help us willingly. A chill ran down my spine as I realized another dangerous adventure awaited us. Without wasting time, Mr. Mortimer began creating a new portal. You need to leave immediately, he continued. I barely had time to catch my breath before another vortex of light and magic opened before us. We stepped into the portal and the world around us swirled, mixing colors and sounds. My body felt the familiar sensation of weightlessness and I understood that we were plunging into the unknown once again. 
As the vortex began to subside, we found ourselves in a different place. The night was dark, illuminated only by occasional lights flickering in the distance. Ancient trees towered around us, and the sound of water could be heard somewhere nearby. We were near an old mansion surrounded by dense trees. It was nighttime, and the building looked abandoned as if no one had lived there for many years. The moon dimly lit the area, casting long shadows on the ground. The surroundings were quiet, with only the rustling of leaves in the wind adding to the eerie atmosphere. Yorick whispered in my ear, Take out the compass. I obediently reached into the magical pouch and pulled out an old compass. The compass was made of bronze, with an elegant lid adorned with carvings and magical symbols. Inside, under the glass cover, was a dial with letters instead of numbers and a needle that slowly spun, obeying the magic. Enter the phrase Dragon's Tear, Yorick instructed. I carefully inscribed the phrase on a small plaque inside the compass. As soon as I finished, the compass glowed with a soft golden light. The needle spun several times, then pointed confidently in one direction. That's it, whispered Yorick. Follow the needle. We cautiously moved forward, trying to make as little noise as possible. We approached the mansion's massive wooden door. It was slightly ajar, and holding our breath, we slipped inside. The interior was dark, but the faint moonlight streaming through the windows allowed us to make out our surroundings. We found ourselves in a spacious hall covered in dust. Old paintings hung on the walls, their images barely discernible in the dim light. The air was filled with the smell of mold and dampness. We followed the compass needle, which confidently led us deeper into the house. Passing by old furniture and antique items, we moved down a corridor, staying in the shadows. Soon the compass pointed to a staircase leading down to the basement. Descending, we found ourselves in front of a massive iron door. I cautiously pushed it, and the door creaked open. Behind the door, a long corridor greeted us, dimly lit by flickering lamps. We walked along the walls, trying not to attract attention. At the end of the corridor was another door, behind which, according to the compass needle, lay the dragon's tear. We carefully entered. The room was filled with various rare and antique items. Shelves were lined with all sorts of artifacts but our eyes immediately fell on a small crystal vessel in a prominent place. Inside it shimmered a golden liquid, a dragon's tear. I took a step forward, but stopped upon hearing a rustle. My heart pounded faster, but I gathered my courage and carefully took the vessel. It was warm to the touch, almost alive. I carefully placed it in the pouch, realizing we didn't have much time. As I grabbed the crystal vessel, I felt relief. But it was short-lived. I was about to flee when suddenly an old man appeared in the doorway. He was tall and thin, with a long white beard hanging down to his chest. His eyes burned with a strange, malevolent fire, and his face was lined with deep wrinkles like ancient parchment. He was dressed in an old robe adorned with magical symbols that glowed in the dim light. But my attention quickly shifted to Thomas, who began growling fiercely, his eyes filled with rage. He recognized the old man, the very one who had come to him that fateful night and left the amulet on his doorstep. It's him! Thomas shouted, his voice merging with the roar of the beast. He started losing control his body beginning to distort and transform. Bones cracked and reformed, skin sprouted thick fur, fangs elongated and his eyes glowed yellow. Thomas, no! I tried to stop him, but it was too late. Thomas fully transformed into a werewolf and lunged at the old man. With a loud roar, he leaped forward, claws extended, ready to tear his target apart. 
the old man seemed prepared for this. He raised his hand, and a burst of magical light shot from his palm, striking Thomas and throwing him back. The battle began. Thomas got back on his feet and charged forward with incredible speed. The old man summoned a protective field around himself, which flared every time Thomas tried to break through with his claws. Magical flashes filled the room, casting bright shadows on the walls. Holding the vial with the dragon's tear, I tried to hide behind one of the shelves, but the fight continued with unprecedented ferocity. Thomas attacked the old man again and again, his roar filling the room. Each attack from the werewolf grew more desperate, and I saw his rage only increase. However, the old man was a powerful adversary. He used strong spells repeatedly repelling Thomas. Thomas fought fiercely, but his strength began to wane. The old man seized the moment, casting a spell that paralyzed Thomas, who fell to the floor, transforming back into a human and unable to move. Enough, the old man said coldly, his eyes burning with malice. He slowly approached the fallen Thomas, who struggled against the paralysis but to no avail. No, I knew I had to act and quickly pulled out a small vial from the pouch a potion Mr. Mortimer had given me before our journey. It was a paralysis potion, prepared specifically for such an occasion. I crept up to the old man and threw the vial at his feet. The potion shattered, and thick smoke enveloped the old man. He screamed as he felt his movements begin to slow. I rushed to Thomas, trying to free him, but the old man managed to utter another spell. His eyes flashed and a magical wave threw me back. You don't know who you're dealing with, the old man growled, his voice trembling with rage. But I knew I couldn't give up. Getting back on my feet, I rushed to Thomas again, ignoring the pain. I managed to reach him and grabbed his hand, trying to help him up. We need to get out of here, I shouted, knowing our chances of winning were slim. The old man, regaining his strength, raised his hand, ready to deliver the final blow. Just when I thought it was the end, Mr. Mortimer materialized out of thin air. His sudden appearance was like a lifeline, and I couldn't help but wonder if he had been watching me all along. Mr. Mortimer, sensing my unease, gave a slight smile and stepped forward, his gaze fixed on the old man. The old man... Seeing Mr. Mortimer instantly paled and stepped back, his eyes widening in horror. The atmosphere grew tense, as if the very air was filled with a menacing energy. It reminded me of what I had seen in the mirror world. No, you can't be here, the old man whispered, his voice trembling with panic. Mr. Mortimer approached calmly his presence both terrifying and commanding respect. The old man, muttering some words, pulled a small mirror from his robe and threw it at his feet. The mirror began to expand like a liquid, spreading across the floor. In the reflection, I saw another world filled with strange and frightening images. The old man jumped into the mirror, and his body disappeared into another reality. As soon as he passed through, the mirror shattered with a loud crash, scattering shards across the room, and everything returned to normal. I stood there, breathing heavily, realizing that the old man had managed to escape. Mr. Mortimer approached me, his face calm, but his eyes showing determination. Are you okay? he asked, placing a hand on my shoulder. Yes, I'm fine now, I replied, catching my breath. But he got away. Don't worry, we'll meet him again, Mr. Mortimer said confidently. The important thing is that we now have the dragon's tear. Let's return. We have much work to do. I nodded and looked at Thomas, who was still exhausted but alive. We gathered ourselves and began the journey back, following Mr. Mortimer. I held the vial containing the dragon's tear, feeling that we finally had a chance to help Thomas. When we returned to the shop, Mr. Mortimer immediately began preparing for the ritual. 
The shop was lit by the soft glow of antique lamps, and the magical symbols on the walls seemed alive in this light. We gathered in the center of the room, where Mr. Mortimer had already laid out the necessary ingredients. He carefully took out the meadow flower petals gathered under the full moon. Wolf's blood blessed by an ancient spell, mandrake root purified in spring water, and finally the dragon's tear. Mr. Mortimer placed all the ingredients into a large silver bowl on the altar and began chanting incantations in an ancient language. The air in the shop started to vibrate, filling with magical energy. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up, and a warm sensation spread through me. Thomas stood nearby, his eyes full of hope and anxiety. Mr. Mortimer slowly poured the dragon's tear into the bowl, and the liquid inside began to glow with a bright golden light. Now, Thomas, Mr. Mortimer said, his voice steady and calm, you need to drink this potion. Thomas, hesitating only for a moment, took the bowl and took a deep breath. He drank the contents in one gulp. As soon as the potion entered his mouth, his body began to glow as if filled with magical light. The spell is complete, Mr. Mortimer announced, removing the bowl. Thomas slowly sank to his knees, his breathing becoming calm and steady. It was clear that the tension and pain were leaving his body. How do you feel? I asked, approaching him. Better, much better, Thomas replied, his voice full of wonder. Mr. Mortimer watched him closely. Now, Thomas, try to transform into a wolf, he instructed. This is an important part of the ritual. Thomas hesitated, fear gripping him again. But summoning his courage, he closed his eyes and concentrated. His body began to change, skin covered with fur, bones cracking and transforming. But this time, his eyes did not lose their human light. He remained conscious, controlling the transformation. Before us stood a huge wolf, but his eyes held intelligence and awareness. Thomas looked at us, and in his gaze, I saw gratitude and relief. You did it, Thomas, Mr. Mortimer said, smiling. Now you can control your transformations. Thomas reverted to human form, his face bright and joyful. We all sighed with relief and joy, knowing our journey had been a success. Thank you, Thomas said, his voice trembling with emotion. You saved me. Mr. Mortimer waved it off as if to say it was nothing, then invited us to have some tea. I hurried to the kitchen and, after preparing tea, returned to the table. We sat around, enjoying the warmth and coziness of the shop. I began to ponder who the old man we saw was and wanted to ask, but Mr. Mortimer spoke first. I have good news and bad news for you, Thomas, he said, his voice serious. Thomas looked at him, his eyes filled with hope and anxiety. Go on, he nodded, gripping his teacup tightly. Mr. Mortimer sighed and continued. While you were gone, I conducted an investigation and discovered that your daughter is alive, but... We stood on the threshold of a nursing home. The building was old but well-maintained, with large windows and a tidy yard. Flowers grew around, creating an atmosphere of peace and comfort. A sign above the entrance read, Sunny Day's Home, adding a touch of hope and warmth to the place. We entered, gently closing the door behind us. Inside was quiet, only the soft shuffle of nurses' steps and quiet conversations could be heard. We walked down a corridor the walls decorated with photographs and paintings depicting scenes from years past. Finally, we stopped at the door of a room. Mr. Mortimer opened it and gestured for Thomas to enter. Thomas stepped in, his steps quiet, his expression serious. In the room on a bed lay an elderly woman. Her eyes were closed and she seemed to be in a deep sleep. 
Mr. Mortimer and I stayed outside, allowing Thomas to be alone. Thomas approached the bed, his heart beating faster. He slowly sat on a chair beside her and took her hand. The woman slowly opened her eyes and looked at him for a long time as if trying to recognize him. Dad, she finally whispered, her voice weak but filled with surprise and joy. Mr. Mortimer and I stepped outside, leaving them alone. Time seemed to stretch, but we knew these moments were crucial for Thomas. After a while, Thomas emerged, his eyes wet, but his face glowing with relief and joy. What did she say? I asked cautiously. It turns out that after my transformation many years have passed, Thomas began, his voice trembling with emotion. She was adopted and lived a happy life. She didn't know what happened to me, but always hoped I would return. She is happy and that's what matters. Mr. Mortimer placed a hand on his shoulder. I'm glad for you, Thomas, he said softly. Now that you know she is safe, what will you do next? Thomas took a deep breath, his face filled with determination. He knelt before Mr. Mortimer. I want to serve you, he said firmly. You saved me and helped me find my daughter. Let me work with you and help others as you helped me. We felt awkward at such a gesture. We helped Thomas to his feet and Mr. Mortimer smiled and said, If you truly wish this, how can I refuse? Welcome to our team, Thomas. And so we had a new member in our shop. Finally, I returned home, replacing my clone that had been maintaining the illusion of my presence. Life returned to its usual routine. Household chores, morning coffee, and the familiar sounds of my home brought a sense of peace and normalcy. I felt a bit tired but content to enjoy ordinary life again. The next morning, arriving at work at Mr. Mortimer's shop, I relaxed a bit. It was nice to sit in the shop, dusting off ancient relics, enjoying the quiet and calm. I thought about how nice it was sometimes just to stay put without any adventures or dangers. I was leisurely dusting the shelves, lost in thought, when suddenly the doorbell rang. I turned, and my heart skipped a beat. 